Thank you. I want to begin by showing you the most beautiful equation. Here it is. Take a look at it. As you see it, I know what you're all thinking. Yeah, that's beautiful. Right? You're taking out your phones, you're taking pictures of it, because this is a beautiful equation. Well, maybe when you see it, you just see symbols. But mathematicians, when we see this, we see beauty. We often talk about beauty and elegance in mathematics. A team of researchers at the University of College London wanted to understand why do mathematicians talk about beauty all the time? So what they did is they got a group of mathematicians to come to their lab, and they had them sit in an fMRI machine so they could scan their brain while they showed them images of equations. And what they discovered is when they showed these mathematicians images of equations such as this, these beautiful equations, the mathematicians, in their brain, the emotional center would light up. The same regions of the brain that light up when you see a great painting, watch a sunset, listen to a beautiful piece of music. Their brains were lighting up. They were seeing beauty. I want to help you right now see that beauty as well. So let's unpack this equation. Inside of it, we have five numbers. One and zero, those are familiar. And then some unfamiliar numbers denoted by the letters E and I and pi. Let's review these. One is very familiar. Count. I have a sheep, one sheep. And once you can count to one, if you have two sheep, you can go one, one, you have two sheep, right? So it's a very natural number. It's the most natural thing. I have one of something. There's a small step of abstraction. I had a sheep. Now I have an abstract idea of one. But it's not that big of a step. How about zero? Well, there's a little bit more difficult of an idea. I have zero sheep. What do you mean you have zero sheep? Well, I have none. If you have no sheep, why are you counting them, right? But, but, but there's, some, there's something there. It took us a while to accept zero, because it's a little bit less natural than one and two and three. But we can wrap our minds around zero. How about the next number in this equation? Pi. You probably remember in, in grade school, learning about pi, the circumference of a circle divided by its diameter always gives you pi. Wait a second. For any circle, a big circle, a small circle, yes, any circle, it's always pi. Well, what is pi? It's a little bit more than 3. It's 3.14, maybe you learned. It actually it goes beyond that. It goes on forever. 3.14159265358979323846264338327950288. Forever. It keeps going. It's not a rational number. We consider it an irrational number. It's very different than like that 1 and that 2 and that 3 from counting sheep. It's a different kind of number. And yet still, it appears naturally in thinking about circles. So we can accept pi despite it being a little bit strange. Here's another irrational number, e. E, maybe you haven't seen this one, or maybe less familiar. It comes up in the calculus. It's really significant in the calculus when we think about rates of change and how the world is changing. E keeps showing up and modeling changing populations or finding areas under curves. The, the idea is a differentiation integration. E shows up all over the place. It's deeply connected to the idea of the infinite. Although it's not infinity, it's just a number a little bit smaller than 3. 2.718281828459000. On and on and on it goes. Another irrational number. But has deep connections with the infinite. And the really cool thing is once we introduce these numbers like pi and e, we find that there's, they pop up in surprising places. For instance, if we go back to pi, one place you maybe wouldn't expect to find pi is when the study of probability. If you drop pins on the floor and you want to know how likely is it to hit a line on the ground, pi shows up there. Or e, e shows up when you start adding up numbers like what is 1 plus 1 divided by 1 plus 1 divided by 1 times 2 plus 1 divided by 1 times 2 times 3 plus 1 divided by plus 1 divided by 1 times 2 times 2 3 times 4 times 5 and so on and so on and forth and so forth. And if you add those all up forever and ever, you end up with e. So introducing these numbers, they're becoming more strange and more mysterious. Perhaps the most mysterious number of them all is i. i is not even real. It's an imaginary number. Perhaps you remember in, in grade school or high school when you first came across i and you're like, an imaginary number, right? This is, this is just, you're playing games with us now. 
What's going on? Well, if I have a number, I can take its square root. The square root of 25 is 5, because 5 times 5 is 25. But what's the square root of negative 1? It can't be a positive, because a positive times a positive is a negative. It can't be a negative, because a negative times a negative is a positive. So it must be this new kind of creature. We just make it up. We say, let's just call it i. We introduce this imaginary number. Why do we do that? Because when we do, we can start doing really cool things. We start solving algebra problems we couldn't solve before. When we expand our understanding of the numbers from just being the real number line to the imaginary and the real numbers combined, you have a whole new set of possibilities. A whole new dimension opens up. And you get these really cool things like, like fractals, the Mandelbrot set emerges, or, or we can do really fascinating complex analysis. And, and it's stuff that mathematicians consider to be beautiful. So we think we're on the right path. Now, you might be suspect. OK, I was with you with the 1 and the 2 and the 3. And I was OK with the 0. Pi and E starting to get a little bit strange. What are you doing with this i? But then you see an equation, like e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. And all the pieces come, and they fit together. And you know that there was something true about this journey we're on. We're not just playing games. They come together in this beautiful way. What is going on here? How is it that mathematicians, just making up ideas like pi and e and i, are able to have them come together in this beautiful way. This is a problem that the theoretical physicist, Nobel Prize winner Eugene Wigner, thought deeply about. He put it this way. He said, the fact that the great mathematician fully, almost ruthlessly, exploits the domain of permissible reasoning and skirts the impermissible. He says, the fact that this recklessness does not lead him into a morass of contradictions, him making up things like I and these irrational numbers, the fact that it doesn't lead into a bunch of contradictions is a miracle, he says. It's a miracle that we can do this kind of mathematics. But then note his comment. Certainly, it is hard to believe that this reasoning power was brought by Darwin's process of natural selection to the perfection which it seems to possess. What is Wigner saying? He's reflecting on the fact that we are able to do mathematics, that we are rational. And he asks, what gives an account for this? Well, if your understanding of the mind is merely that the mind is the end product of a process of natural selection, some unguided process, then why would we trust our minds to be able to reason like this? Why would we expect them to be able to reason this well? After all, natural selection may favor traits such as survivability and the ability to reproduce, but there's nothing in natural selection that favors the ability to reason and to do mathematics. So how is it that we ended up with a mind that's able to do mathematics? Wigner's not the only one who asked this question. Several other mathematicians and physicists have mused about this. Why is it they're capable of doing mathematics? Particularly if we're simply in a, a naturalistic universe, if there's no supernatural element at all, how can we end up with minds that could do this? The Oxford mathematician, John Lennox, he put it this way. He says, naturalism is fatally flawed. Naturalism, the view that there is no God, was simply the end product of some natural series of reactions. He says it's fatally flawed. Why? Because it undermines the foundations of the very rationality that is needed to construct or understand or believe in any kind of argument whatsoever, including those to defend naturalism. Naturalism gives no account for why we can trust our minds. It undermines itself. He concludes, therefore, it doesn't simply shoot itself in the foot, which is painful. It shoots itself in the brain, which is fatal. Lennox is pointing out that in your worldview, you need to give an account for the mind. And if you're not able to do that, then your worldview defeats itself. A really incredible thing, though, is not just that we can do mathematics, evidencing the fact that we are rational, far more rational than any other animal. It's not just the fact that we can do mathematics, but that mathematics goes on to explain the universe around us. Wigner, again, reflected upon this in his paper, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics and the Natural Sciences, puts it this way. The miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift, which we neither understand nor deserve. 
What's he pointing out here? What's his argument? Well, first of all, the very fact that there are laws of nature, that there are some kind of laws of physics, that the universe is ordered, that's surprising in itself. Why would you expect that under naturalism, that there should be some kind of order? But here's the miracle. Not only is there some kind of order out there, some deep structure to the universe, but we can understand it. Our minds are capable of making sense of that order. How? Through the language of mathematics. Wigner says the only appropriate word to describe this is miracle. It's a miracle that we, through mathematics, can understand the deep structure of the universe. It's interesting. If you look back at the history of science, why did the first scientists expect to be able to do what they did? Why did Isaac Newton think he could sit down and come up with some unified theory of gravity to not only explain how things on Earth fall, but also how bodies in heaven move? Simple. Isaac Newton was acting out of the conviction that there was a single mind who created both heaven and Earth. And therefore, believing there to be a mind who created heaven and Earth, he expected that mind to follow a simple set of principles in creating both the heavens and the Earth. He's not the only one. You look at Kepler, or Galileo, or these pioneers of modern science. They were driven by the conviction that there is order in the universe because there's a mind behind the universe. More than that, they believe that they, having been made in the image of this God, had the ability to go out and study and learn about that structure through the language of mathematics. Natural sciences were born out of the Christian conviction that the world is ordered because there is a God. Did you know that? That science, the foundation of science, the basic premises of science, this conviction that there's order, that Einstein put it this way, he said, the most remarkable thing about the universe, the most indescribable thing about the universe is that it is describable, that we can make sense of it. Why? Well, under naturalism, you would have no, no explanation for this. You have no reason to expect there to be order in the universe. But in the doctrine of creation, we come to expect that because there is a mind behind the universe, and our minds are not simply the products of the universe, we can come to understand that order and appreciate that order. But it gets even richer. The miracle is not just that we can do mathematics, and it's not just that our mathematics describes the order of the universe. There's another level of miraculousness going on, and it's Albert Einstein put it this way. He asks, how is it possible that mathematics, which is a product of human thought entirely independent of experience, fits so excellently the objects of physical reality? What's Einstein getting at here? I, I discovered this when I was a graduate student working on my PhD. You see, my office was in the basement. So I had no windows out into the world. The mathematics I was working on in no way was motivated by reality. The only windows in my office were blackboards. And so the ideas I pursued were not ideas that came from understanding the physical world around me, but they were ideas that I thought were beautiful. Mathematically beautiful. And so we had pursued these mathematically beautiful ideas. This is how mathematics has been progressing. I'll give you an example of it. You learn about geometry in secondary school. You learn about you know, triangles and points and lines. And this is the geometry that dates back to the Greeks. Now, in many ways, that kind of geometry is motivated by the world around you. You have some intuition of how objects exist in the world, how lines work in the world. But mathematicians, you know, they had too much free time on their hands. And so what they decided to do is they said, I wonder if we can change the rules of the game. What if we can tinker with the basic axioms of geometry? There was one in particular that had to do with parallel lines and, and how these parallel lines are, are related to each other. They said, let's tinker with that and make up entirely new rules to the game and see what happens. Now, most people would think, well, why are you doing that? You're making up some rules to a non-existent universe. You're describing something that is in no way grounded to reality. But we're mathematicians, we don't care. It's a fun game. We're in our basement, we're not thinking about reality. We're on our blackboards, the math is working out, it looks really neat. And so mathematicians in the 17 and 1800s began developing non-Euclidean geometries. Weird geometries where the rules of the game are very different. What's not the kind of geometry you expect. 
okay, well, they did this, it was a fun game, let them do their thing, that's fine. But then Einstein comes on the scene in the 20th century, and he's trying to make sense of the universe. He's trying to formulate his general theory of relativity. And it turns out in the process of him formulating this, well, Euclidean geometry doesn't do the trick. And he stumbles upon these non-Euclidean geometries. These, these games these mathematicians were just playing and just making up the, 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 the things they were just playing with. But it turns out that those geometries what he needed. He discovered that, that space is, is curved, there's a space-time, and the curvature of space-time is not best described by the natural Euclidean geometry, but by this weird non-Euclidean geometry that the mathematicians had created. What's going on here? Ideas that the mathematicians had come up with simply because they thought they were beautiful and interesting, those ideas turn out to be the very same things 100 years later that are needed to actually describe the universe. And this is not a standalone story. We talked earlier about I. I is a weird imaginary number, right? Where does that come from? Mathematicians are just playing games, making up fake numbers, imaginary numbers. But today, I is essential during physics. We can't make sense of reality without the imaginary number. Time and time again, mathematicians come across and develop mathematics purely because they find it interesting and beautiful, and they're pursuing these ideals of beauty. And, and as they do this, they don't care if it's useful or not. They're just there producing mathematics. But then, a decade, two decades, 100 years later, someone comes along and they go, that's the math I need to describe the universe. There's some kind of deep connection between the product of the human mind, simply products of our creativity, things that we find to be beautiful with the structure we see in the universe. Is that not a great testimony to the fact that we are made in the image of the creator of the world? The fact that what we see as beautiful, God himself sees as beautiful when he created the world? It's a beautiful picture. And so we've seen now these miracles of mathematics, the miracle that we can do mathematics, the second miracle that mathematics explains the structure of the universe, that there is structure there, but that structure can be explained mathematically. The third miracle, that these mathematicians develop the ideas before they are discovered to be use, useful to describe the universe. They, just, they are just pursuing ideals of beauty and they come up with these ideas. But there's a fourth miracle of mathematics I want to end with, one I've become particularly excited about. In the last century, there was a mathematician by the name of Kurt Gordel, and he discovered something called his incompleteness theorem. What Kurt Gödel discovered is that we'll never be done doing mathematics. There's no end to it. Now, some of you may think that's horrifying, <laughs> right? Like, like, it doesn't stop with calculus, you gotta keep going. But Kurt Gödel found this fascinating. Mathematicians get excited about this. This means there's no end to mathematical discovery. We can be forever pursuing ideals of truth and beauty and see how they come together to describe the world around us. As a Christian in particular, this excites me because when I, on my blackboard, I'm doing mathematics, my blackboard becomes a window into eternity. It reminds me that these concepts, they're gonna take forever to exhaust and yet God has given us the gift of eternity because of what he's done in his son. The book of Ecclesiastes reminds us that God has set eternity in the human heart. Mathematics awakens that, that longing for eternity. Ellen White, in a vision of the world to come, at the end of the book, Education, puts it this way. She says, heaven is a school. Its field of study, the universe. Its teacher, the infinite one. That is what we have been invited into. A recognition that us being made in the image of God are able to study and understand the world and pursue ideals of truth and beauty and come to a deeper and deeper appreciation of God who is the truth and who is the embodiment of beauty. We can pursue that. And that pursuit doesn't have to end, but because of what God has done in Christ, we continue to pursue that for eternity. I'm excited about that. I hope you are too.